Hello and welcome to another live discussion. This is about citizen science. Now, some of you avid viewers will know that we tried to do a show about citizen science last week, but the technology completely failed on us. But here we are doing that show again. So what is citizen science? What better way to explain what it is than to show a video? So let's take a look. When you hear the word science, what comes to mind? Lonely PhDs mixing solutions in their labs late at night? That may be so, but the concept of the citizen scientist is making a comeback. Yes, you, the ordinary, plain, simple non-scientist, can make a difference. Have you ever fancied yourself as a planet-spotting scientist, but been put off by the cost of buying your own Kepler space telescope? Well, fear not, because now you can spot to your heart's content from the comfort of your computer. Meet Zooniverse, the portal for citizen scientists. Hi, I'm David. And this is my attempt to send a radio control airplane into the edge of space <coughs> using a weather balloon and then pilot it down using a live video feed. So our whole show today is kind of ex uh, inspired by uh, RC Explorer's video. He managed to get a remote controlled vehicle of some description so high up in the atmosphere and get some great footage. We really wanted to look at citizen science, so we did the show. We have a great collection of people involved in citizen science in some form or another with us today, so I might as well introduce you to get this conversation started. We have Dr. Laura White from the Adler Planetarium, who was with us last week, but unfortunately the technology meant we couldn't really continue with the debate. We have Cindy Amuki from the Extreme Citizen Science Research Group from the UCL. We have Oliver Medovic from uh, GenSpace, which is an organization promoting citizen science in New York. We have Yasser Ansari from Project NOAA. It's a, a platform that helps citizen science document wildlife discoveries. And we have Stephen Dufresne from the YouTube channel Rimstar, where you can learn to make all manner of interesting contraptions. But Dr. Laura White, if we could start with you, why is citizen science a good way to do science, do you think? Well, the particular science that we do at the Zooniverse involves taking massive data sets and putting them online and asking members of the public to help with the analysis. And it's a good way of doing science because the people who are involved in our projects are doing something that couldn't be achieved otherwise. Um, for instance, Galaxy Zoo, we ask members of the public to classify galaxies and computers just aren't very good at this. But um, humans, on the other hand, are extremely good at pattern recognition. So the data that we've collected um, and has led to, um, in the realms of 40 published papers so far, um, has kind of moved our knowledge and understanding of the shapes and sizes of galaxies in a way that wouldn't be possible without the help of these citizens. So what, is it, what kind of tasks are the people that you uh, work with, the citizen science, what kind of tasks do they do? Well, they, they vary uh, depending on the project. Um, in the case of Galaxy Zoo, it's very simple pattern recognition. It's asking people to tell us what the galaxies look like, what shapes are they. And it's something that really requires no training at all. I've done it with groups of kids, and I've spent 10 seconds explaining to them, this is a spiral, this is an elliptical. And they can understand that straight away. Um, some of our other projects are slightly more involved. Uh, we have a project called Old Weather, where we ask people to transcribe ship's logs. Um, once again, doesn't take a lot of training to kind of uh, take the numbers and letters that they see in a ship's log and kind of type them in. We've got Planet Hunters, um, which you mentioned in your video, uh, where we ask people to look at Kepler data and to look for the on light curves and look for the features that occur when a planet passes in front of a star. Um, and this is something that, you know, we, we were a little unsure as to whether people would be able to do this or whether they'd want to do it because light curve data is not it's not as um, accessible as looking at beautiful images of galaxies, uh, but it turns out that people are very good at it. And there's been four confirmed planets so far that would never have been discovered if it hadn't been for the efforts of the Planet Hunters volunteers. So four planets have been discovered. For anyone at home interested in taking part in citizen science, I don't know if there are any 
better fact that could get you inspired that you could well discover a planet. Another thing, uh, Dr. Laura, why we found when we ventured into citizen science, the response we got was incredible. Many, many people were interested in it. So we thought we'd have to come back and do the show. I should say to anyone watching at home, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, get them in a comment. I've got the laptop right here and we'll be able to put them to our guests. Cindy Amuki from the Extreme Citizen Science Place. Maybe you can explain a bit about the science that you guys do and why citizen science is exciting. So the, the reason that we find it exciting is because we're thinking that communities can come up with the problems that they want to explore, then come up with the protocols of how to collect the data in a way that it's meaningful and suitable for their lives, then collect the data, analyze it, and act for it. And that's what we're trying to do in different parts of the world. So what can you do with citizen science that you, can't, uh, you couldn't do before citizen science? So, for example, uh, we had one community where people were complaining about noise from the local scrapyard. And it was just dismissed as just an opinion. But once they get into citizen science and can start collecting noise monitoring data and then plot it on the map and show it around, that becomes more reliable information that can be discussed in different uh, circles. You can look at um, citizen science as uh, engagement at different levels depending on, on the nature of a project or on the nature of, of the need. So you can have, for example, people engaging in crowdsourcing type projects where they are interested in, in birds, so they do bird watching, they do uh, all sorts of activities that require them to go and gather data and then share it, and that contributes to a larger body of knowledge. You can also have people getting in, engaged in actually analyzing data and structures like online games, folding proteins, and then you know, contributing to solutions to to uh, finding cures for diseases. Um, and there are then other levels of engagement where it's actually people who define the problem themselves and go through the whole process of the scientific research. So all the way from um, defining the problem, collecting the data, analyzing that data, and then deciding what to do with that data and what action to take. Yes, sir. Let's, let's come to you. We were speaking, or Cindy was certainly talking there about uh, people can be engaged by analyzing data, by having a lot of people all take part in the same activity. You're from Project NOAA. Um, yeah. I know a little bit about that. Maybe you could explain to our viewers what that is and how uh, citizens are engaging with that project. Sure. So uh, Project NOAA is uh, really simple. I mean, we set out to basically turn mobile devices into digital butterfly nets and location-based field guides. And so we have an app called Project NOAA and a website as well where people from all over the world, uh, we have over 185,000 members uh, from all over the world, share wildlife observations, uh, contribute to uh, specific citizen science initiatives, help each other um, identify species and learn more about the wildlife that they encounter. But more importantly, uh, we look at citizen science as a vehicle to really mobilize a new generation of scientists and particularly for us, nature explorers and earth stewards. And so for, for our community, the way we've structured it is it's more about community engagement, participation, that sort of stuff. And, and the collection of data is almost secondary in the sense that it's about exploring, documenting what you encounter, getting pe uh, help with, from people who can help you learn more about what you've encountered. But collectively, we've gathered over a terabyte of user-generated data now. And that's where the citizen science angle comes in. So our approach, you know, in the broader spectrum of citizen science, on one end you have things that are very much science heavy and on the other side you have things that are very uh, citizen heavy if you will and we're we're more on the citizen side and the you know the basic premise is that all scientists start as amateurs we want to develop more engaging ways for beginners to get hooked and become you know lifelong curious naturalists or scientists so what exactly uh, would people do if they were taking part in project NOAA? how does it work if someone at home like right now would like to try this Sure. So there's a couple things you can do. Um, uh, you can share an observation. So let's say you're uh, on a hike or you're in your backyard or at the park and you saw an interesting form of wildlife, a plant, an insect, a bird. You can take a photograph of that, add some uh, descriptive notes, 
and share a location and submit that to Project NOAA, either through our mobile app or our website. So that's one form of participation. Then if you don't know what it is that you saw, our community from around the world can suggest species IDs with reference links to everything from Wikipedia to the Encyclopedia of Life. So it becomes kind of a collaborative learning uh, environment or classroom. The other uh, aspect of the project is you can pull information out. So based on your location, if you're using our app, you can see all the wildlife that people around you have uh, documented. So you can learn about the wildlife that's around you when you're in physical proximity to it. So it's this notion of place-based learning. And then the third aspect of Project NOAA is really these uh, missions or quests or adventures, whatever you want to call them. We call them missions. And these are specific tasks that you can participate in. They could be uh, you know, documenting moths during National Moth Week. It could be sharing photos from the Galapagos Islands with our partners at the Charles Darwin Research Foundation uh, to share your wildlife that's encountered there. Or uh, initiatives that are just for fun, you know, birds with the color red or insects of the color yellow and that sort of stuff. So basically you can share observations, learn more about it, document what you've seen. You can um, pull out information and see what's around you and learn about it when you're next to it. And you can participate in specific quests, if you will, uh, that we call missions. So, so it sounds like an incredibly interesting project. We will put a link up to uh, everybody's different areas of research in the description. But we've spoken a lot about the ways that citizens can get involved in analyzing data, helping scientists to make better sense of data, coming up with new problems to solve. But there are also experiments that people can do. So Oliver, perhaps you can explain a little about the um, biotechnology laboratory that you helped set up. Right, so <clears throat> when we set up GenSpace uh, a few years ago, uh, we set it up as a community biotechnology laboratory. Uh, so the basic underlying premise was to uh, lower the barriers to entry to individuals wishing to do biotech. Uh, and that was really the, the key, we believe, to allow people to practice biotechnology. Uh, laboratories are generally inaccessible. They're very expensive. Um, but we're seeing more and more equipment now enter the marketplace that is uh, cheaper, uh, but still a, a a space in which people can do their projects uh, is a necessity. So we basically set out to build a shared laboratory where people can come together and uh, share the equipment, uh, share the knowledge base, and have a place where they can carry out projects. And since we've been, since we've opened our doors in uh, December of 2010, we've had a number of different uh, projects take place here. We've had a whole slew of events. Uh, we've had every everything from we've had uh, collaborations with Cold Spring Harbor and the Urban Bar Cleaning Project. So we've hosted high school students and their teachers using our facility as essentially a satellite lab where they would process DNA samples that they obtained from the wild, uh, so they would be able to uh, send uh, plant samples and insect samples uh, to determine which sort of species they were uh, and obtain a catalog of species in the New York City area. Uh, we have individuals working on. Uh, personal projects, um, and one of the coolest things about a space like GenSpace, um, so my background is, uh, you know, I have a, a PhD in molecular biology, and we tend to be a little isolated when we focus on our projects, and you rarely have artists and designers and, um, you know, electronics uh, buffs uh, use the laboratory at the same time that uh, uh, biologists are using a lab, but in our space, we have artists working uh, on projects, and they collaborate with the biologists, and uh, really cool things happen when you when you put people together from a variety of different disciplines. Uh, we have an artist, uh, Heather Dewey Hagborg, who uh, used our facility to um, uh, really run a very uh, cool series of projects that really lied at the intersection, I would say, at sociology and uh, biology and art, she went around the city um, gathering um, basically stray um, garbage that people discarded that we consider garbage or we've considered garbage for a long time, uh, such as cigarette butts uh, and, and other litter like, like coffee cups. And she was able to um, extract DNA from these discarded materials and uh, learn about DNA sequencing. Uh, so she really didn't have any background. She took classes here. That's something we also offer. With that information that she armed herself with, she was able to uh, obtain some uh, sequence data that uh, enabled her to um, put together portraits of these individuals that had discarded these materials, such as um, the uh, probability of what sort of eye color they had, uh, their ethnicity, their uh, sex. And it really led to some penetrating <coughs> questions, such as, you know, uh, in this, this day and age, um, the technology that we have. Uh, you can obtain a whole uh, lot of information that we normally um, simply just 
disposed of and didn't give second thought to. And uh, so, can I uh, just just to try and paraphrase? Do you know a lady who managed to ascertain the color of someone's eyes based on the things that they threw away? Is that correct? That's true. So, with sequencing technology, um, it, with basically with our you know with the technology that we have now, with more and more sequence data being generated, uh, you can you can obtain a lot of information from individuals just based on their genomic information. And was that just, I'm interested in this point because it seems a very strange one. She figured that out uh, from the rubbish that she had or did she somehow extract genetic data from the rubbish and figure it out that way? Well, anything you discard, basically, if it has any, if it has a few of your cells on it, uh, you essentially have your entire uh, genomic library locked away in those cells. Wow. That's a very interesting point, and I, I, I love to learn uh, brand new things. I had no idea that someone could figure out my eye color based on my rubbish. We live in a very strange time. But you were speaking there about bringing together um, the people with different backgrounds, artists, scientists, uh, biotech guys. It's a strange hop and a leap, but YouTube is a place that does that. People put their own stuff up there. People have all sorts of different ideas. And Steve Dufresne, you're from Rimstar. You... Um, help people build strange contraptions, scientific experiments. What's your experience of that being like? Have people been positive towards that? Uh, very much so. One correction first, it's uh, rimstar.org, O-R-G, at the end. Oh, sorry. Um, we'll make sure we put the links up in the description. It's rimstar.org. We'll make sure uh, you, can, you can check that out, guys. Um, yeah, actually, it's very positive. I've been getting a lot of um, comments from teachers lately who are saying they're using my videos in their classes. And I, I, for years, I've been getting uh, comments from students saying that they, um, they, uh, you know, didn't understand it in class. But once they watch the video, they do understand it. And these are science classes; these are science topics. So it's it's a very very positive response. What kind of things uh, are you helping people to build? What kind of machines? Uh, anything from a simple electroscope, which uh, uses electrostatics. Um, uh, to do experiments and make measurements to um, things like Fresnel lenses for uh, concentrating sunlight in order to produce heat um, or electricity. Um, Stirling engines uh, which do uh, conversion, uh, you make a different, use a difference between cold and hot in order to produce me mechanical energy. Um, just, just a whole uh, range of things. Plus I also talk about other topics like what is fire, how does nuclear fusion work in the sun, things, like, things of that sort. So what kind of thing would you be able to build uh, that you might be quite surprised you're able to build? You know, if there's, often people don't think you can build particularly uh, powerful or strange or wacky contraption, but what might surprise people they could build in their own room? Or? Uh, things like a Wimsource machine, for example, uh, using simple things like CDs, cardboard, shoelace, uh, just, just to talk about one that I did last week. Uh, using those very simple parts, you can make something that you hand crank and produce sparks and high voltage sparks with. Um, awesome. So if you guys, anybody wants to uh, make any of these contraptions, they're all on uh, Stephen's YouTube channel, which is Rimstar. Well, Rimstar.org. We'll put a link up in the description. I have a comment here from Lady Smith on uh, YouTube. He's watching now. It's a uh, Michio Kaku reference, and she says, I believe this the whole of citizen science, I, I, I gather, will bring us closer to a type 1 civilization sooner if there were uh, not citizen scientists. I'm not saying that I'll experience this in my lifetime, but if I do, then that's a bonus. So maybe Dr. Laura White, I'm not sure if you know what a type 1 civilization is, but do you think, in a nutshell, citizen science is speeding up the process of discovery? I think, um, yeah, I think for, for two reasons, really. I think it's speeding up the, the um, process of discovery because we can get more work done because more people are involved. Um, but I like to think that it's also leveling the playing field. Um, you know, that the more people, we're, we're lowering the barrier to entry. Um, and as I believe the um, lady and gentleman from UCL were talking about kind of those different levels of citizen science that we have, um, you know, they're, they're doing some very involved citizen science that's very community-based and gets people in from the very beginning of the scientific process. We're kind of more bringing people in more towards the end, the sort of data analysis kind of steps. Um, and we have some people who just do that uh, very simply by maybe doing a classification and other people who get more heavily engaged in our, um, our discussion tools. 
Um, but by making access kind of, shall we say, it, it's more democratic. It's more kind of, you know, more involved for more for a greater number of people. I think that's only got to lead to kind of more open scientific discovery and hopefully faster scientific discovery. I have um, another question here from Alan Charnock. This is from YouTube, but perhaps Yassi, you can answer this one. He's sure. interested in this question. Should we go through with the de-extinction and bring back extinct animals? That's a really good and, and timely question. There was a big TEDx event in D.C. hosted by National Geographic uh, just last week where they brought thought leaders from around the world talking about the resurrection of extinct species. It's a, it's a touchy subject, and I'll dive into it in a second, but just so people know, Project NOAA is actually a joint venture with National Geographic, and we work very closely with them. Uh, so with that being said, my personal feeling is that, you know, we suck at keeping the species that are already on the planet alive. Why bring many of them back uh, until we have kind of a better understanding of how to keep them alive? And also, um, there's been some really interesting articles uh, written re recently in, kind of a, in a response to this de-extinction event, is that, you know, bringing a species and just popping it back to life is, is one step. And with the you know, advancement of tools and capabilities, it's becoming more and more possible. But there's a big ecological component to this as well, is if they come back, where are they going to live? If those habitats are still being destroyed and polluted, what's the point of bringing them back? And so, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting things to talk about, and it's very exciting. Uh, if it gets more people interested in talking about science, number one, and the importance of preserving e environments and ecosystems, I think it's great, but as far as my personal take on bringing things back to life, I'm still kind of looking at both sides of the equation and, and kind of trying to see what's best. Mookie, if we, thanks very much uh, for that, yeah. So Mookie, if we could come to you. Uh, people are interested in getting involved in science. Maybe you could, guys could offer some advice on how they do that if they're at a young age, say 13, 14, or 15 years old. What should they do? Uh, there, there are now plenty of places around where they can find the information and start to do their own work. So the first thing is to understand that science is not something special. It's not something that happened in a university or in a very high level of research. There is a lot of science that you can do at home and on a daily basis. And you can think about the problem that, that bother you where you live, such as the air pollution or uh, you can, for example, in the UK and in the US, participate in something called nature calendar, where you watch for all kind of events that happen throughout the year, such as the first bloom of flowers or the last uh, leaves on tree, and so on. And you are contributing to science through that activity. But then you can figure out that you can do things by, for example, learning how to program tools like Raspberry Pi or Arduino and then get some sensors and start working with them. Cindy is kind of doing a lot of work in this area, so maybe she can comment on how to play learn with that. I think people don't necessarily have to look. I mean, it's great that, that, that they, there are these places where they can you know, easily join an ongoing project and contribute to something that is already out there and happening. But people can get a lot of motivation uh, from going to fora uh, such as Instructables and take a look in there at people who are do-it-yourselfers that go by themselves. They find out about how to connect things in different ways and find out solutions and then share these insights with each other and um, form online communities. And it can be fun projects, it can be purposeful projects and for example, the Public Laboratory for Open Technology, for Open Science and Technology, um, is a group of uh, makers and uh, citizens and um, designers and just people, regular citizens that got together to solve a real issue that was uh, of, of big importance to them. And online, they've shared information, they make prototypes, people take those prototypes, um, then they um, repurpose them, change them, share their insights, and the knowledge is just spread and spread and spread. And it motivates a lot of people to see that other people are doing other things and are learning from each other. They don't have to be, as Mookie said, scientists. They don't have to have even specialized backgrounds, as long as they have the will and um, 
self-belief that they actually can just go out there, grab tools, do things, and join in uh, or do their own. Well, we're going to be talking about citizen science a huge uh, amount now because the interest we've had in it since we first mentioned we were going to do a show on it has been so big. It's clear that you guys want to talk, want us to talk about it more. So we're definitely going to be doing that. Uh, so if, I'm sure anyone who's following us on Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, you'll begin to see some links to these awesome projects that Cindy's been talking about, uh, and we'll also put them in the description, of course. We ha I have another comment here that perhaps um, Oliver, because you were talking about this earlier. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about this. This is from Karen B. Cooper, and she says, Sampling DNA on garbage without permission raises some serious ethical issues. Do you think that's true? Yes. Oh, it, cer it certainly does. Um, it's, and I think that was one of the reasons for the project. It, it basically um, it underscored a lot of privacy issues and put, put, the, put the, um, the privacy issues in a context that people um, normally would not uh, be presented, uh, normally wouldn't see, see this, these issues presented in such a context. So the artist actually made three-dimensional sculptures of the, the putative individuals uh, that had dis discarded this rubbish and uh, put them on display. And uh, surprisingly, um, many jurisdictions um, don't have any, any uh, laws that deal with, with um, you know, garbage or trash that you throw out and, and don't have any, any um, you know, there's no, the regulations have not caught up with, with um, the powers of the technology that we have at our disposal and what we can do with this technology. So one of the, you know, um, reasons for this type of project was to put this issue uh, in front of people in, in, a, in a way that would make them feel slightly uncomfortable um, and uh, basically confront um, these, you know, powerful uh, sociological issues uh, in, a, in a way that would be um, not so abstract. So if this was written about in a scientific journal, perhaps it would be buried and nobody would really give much, pay much attention to it. But now all of a sudden you see, uh, you know, a 3D printed image of somebody who um, used a public restroom uh, hanging up on a wall. Um, how does that make you feel? So um, I think that sounds that that sounds like the single most incredible uh, art project I've heard in a long time. That someone printed out. Uh, the shape of someone based on the DNA they found in the rubbish. You may well have heard it here or somewhere else first, but I, I'm going to say you heard that here first. Uh, <laughs> Oliver, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, Docs Laura Thank White, you. Cindy, Amuki, Yasser, and Stephen uh, from Rimstyle Rob, which is an awesome YouTube channel that everybody should check out. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you all very much. To so anyone watching at home, we are going to be covering this stuff more because uh, everybody on the team is really interested in it. It is really interesting, so expect more of it if you haven't already hit subscribe do hit that button because we've got uh, live shows coming up every uh, day basically and I should say uh, that our debate on Thursday is going to be an incredibly interesting one how does modern propaganda work that's live uh, this Thursday at 7 p.m. so thanks very much to all our guests uh, and yeah we may well be back in touch soon when we cover this kind of thing more thanks guys cheers thanks. <laughs>